Hello, good afternoon. A warm welcome to Dr. Trip Gulick to give the CIFAR seminar today. Uh, Dr. Gulick will be introduced by our own Dr. Candice Sternberg. She's an assistant professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. So Candice, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Gulick. Dr. Gulick is a Rochelle Belfer Professor in Medicine and Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Weill Cornell Medicine and an attending physician at the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. He is board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. His research interests include designing, conducting, and analyzing clinical trials to refine antiretroviral therapy strategies for HIV treatment and prevention and assess antiretroviral agents with new mechanisms of action. He currently serves as principal investigator of the Cornell, New Jersey HIV Clinical Trials Unit of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group and the HIV Prevention Trials Network, sponsored by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He also serves as the co-chair of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Panel on Clinical Practices, for treatment of HIV infection and previously served as a member and as a chair of the Antiviral Drugs Advisory Committee of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and as a member and as chair of the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Committee. He most recently serves as the co-chair of the NIH COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel. He's a member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation the Association of American Physicians, International AIDS Society, and the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and has presented at national and international meetings and published widely. Thank you for joining us today. Candice, thanks for that very generous, overly generous introduction. It's really a pleasure to join you all today, although I have to say I wish I was down there in Miami with you. Um, I was mentioning earlier, it got down to minus three degrees last week here. It was very chilly, but we're up to a balmy 37 degrees this afternoon. Um, we're going to talk about HIV treatment advances. Where are we in 2023? I have no disclosures. Um, as mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the government HIV treatment guidelines panel, and I will discuss investigational antiviral agents on this talk today. So to know where we're going, we have to know where are we? Where are we with ART in 2023? So as everyone knows, we now start antivirals at all stages of HIV infection. There are now 35 US FDA approved drugs in six broad mechanistic classes, the nucleosides, the non-nukes, the protease inhibitors, the integrase inhibitors, four kinds of entry inhibitors, and then the newest class just most recently added, the capsid inhibitors. Initial ART regimens worldwide have one standard strategy. The whole world agrees now, one to two nucleosides together with an integrase inhibitor. And in the occurrence of virologic failure, the next ART regimen should include at least two active drugs, one with a high barrier to resistance. And that's where we are today. Here are the 35 FDA-approved antiretroviral drugs as of 2023. Um, on the left-hand side are the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the nucleosides, and the non-nucleosides, or NNRTIs. The biggest approved class are the HIV protease inhibitors. We now have five integrase inhibitors. And then as mentioned, four kinds of entry inhibitors and the very first capsid inhibitor. Now, if you added these up, you'd say, Gulick, that's not 35 drugs. What's the deal? And it turns out that we have now taken five drugs off the marketed list of compounds. And you can see them listed there. DDI, DDC, D4T, Dilaverdine, and Amprenavir have now all been removed from currently marketed agents, mostly because of toxicity 
issues or inconvenience issues. And it's worth noting Fosamprenivir will actually come off the market as of January of next year. So we continue to refine our antivirals and we obviously stress drugs that are potent, convenient and well tolerated. Part of that has been co-formulations which have become so popular both with patients and providers. The very first one was TDF, FTC and Afavirenz um, all in one pill, one, two, three, so three drugs in one pill. And that became essentially the holy grail of antivirals, one pill, once a day therapy. That was so popular that you can see there's been an explosion of one pill, once a day therapies. Many of these are integrase inhibitor based, but we also continue to have the non-nucleoside based ones and even a protease inhibitor based one. And the first two drug in one pill, uh, several of those compounds also shown for you here. So here are the current USDHHS treatment guidelines, the recommended initial regimens for most people. And the outline of the regimen is, as I mentioned, one to two nucleosides plus an integrase inhibitor. And the guidelines say the recommended integrase inhibitors are either Bictegravir or dolutegravir. And you can see the nucleoside combos that they are, are given with, as we've come to know, TAF-FTC, abacavir 3TC, or either form of tenofovir with FTC or 3TC. The uh, fourth regimen listed here is the first two drug regimen that is now recommended for initial therapy, and that's dolutegravir 3TC on the basis of non-inferiority with three drug regimens. Also worth noting that three out of four of these are one pill, once a day regimens. So where are we? The uh, regimens that you just saw really are justified because of head-to-head -head comparisons with some of the regimens that previously had been our go-to regimens. So in these older studies, you can see integrase inhibitor regimens like abacavir 3 tc dolutegravir in a head-to-head -head comparison with a two-drug plus a favarins regimen, which was the standard of care at the time, succeeded on reducing viral load levels in 80% of people below 50 copies through the end of 96 weeks or two years. That was a statistically significant difference favoring the integrase inhibitor. The Flamingo study was in parallel, tested two nukes with dolutegravir versus two nukes with boosted darunavir, the go-to protease inhibitor. And once again, the integrase inhibitor was found to be significantly better than the boosted PI. And then we began to compare within classes. So the 1489 study compared two nukes in bictegravir and two nukes in dolutegravir and found very comparable rates of virologic suppression um, as high as 90% through the end of two years. And then as just mentioned, the Gemini studies looked at a standard three drug regimen, TDF, FTC, dolutegravir, head to head comparison with the two drug regimen of three TC dolutegravir and found the two drug regimen was non-inferior. So all of these clinical trials really support the guidelines I just showed you. We do have alternative regimens listed in the guidelines. Here's where the additional integrase inhibitors ended up. L-vitegravir considered alternative because it requires the booster, cobacistat, and raltegravir because it's dosed twice a day. And in addition, both of these have a lower barrier to resistance than either bictegravir or dolutegravir. Here's where the protease inhibitors ended up as well. You can see either darunavir or adizanavir, both boosted with ritonavir or cobacistat with nucleosides. And the guidelines go on to say boosted darunavir in general preferred over boosted adizanavir. The alternatives are also where the non-nucleoside-based regimens, a uh, class that we turned to routinely several years ago, but now considered alternative because of toxicities and a lower barrier to resistance. And so this is where durabarine, efavirenz, and rilpivirine have all ended up.
And finally, what are the options when you can't take a nucleoside? So a Bacavir, TAF, or TDF, that's a small group of people, doesn't really come up all that often. But the guidelines say turning to that novel two drug regimen of dolutegravir lamivudine is appropriate, except in the case of higher viral load levels, so over 500,000 copies per mil, concomitant hep B infection, because um, you would be treating hep B with only a single agent if you use the two drug regimen, and then no resistance results. There's uh, other options to leave out the nucleosides, such as boosted darunavir and lamivudine, or 3TC, and boosted darunavir plus an integrase inhibitor, but we use those uncommonly. Well, those are the U.S. recommendations. In parallel now are the well, World Health Organization recommendations for first-line ART regimens for adults from low and middle income countries. And once again, the preferred regimen is two nukes with dolutegravir. And now this is combined in a generic pill, which is available throughout the world. So one pill once a day, again, is the treatment of choice for the entire world. The WHO guidelines do list an alternative, which is two nukes plus a favorins, again, available in generic form and widely used throughout the world. If you look at all people taking antivirals on the planet, which is about 29 million people, 80% are now taking two nukes plus dolutegravir. Well, one of the newer agents that really took a step forward in a new way, of course, is cabotegravir. Uh, this is an integrase inhibitor similar to dolutegravir. It's potent in its oral form, but the excitement about this drug, of course, that we all know is its nanotechnology formulation, and it can be given as an injectable agent. It has a very long half-life, which allows infrequent dosing, either monthly or every other month. The safety is reassuring, and the most common side effect with this drug is actually due to injection site reactions, which are mostly mild. So the first injectable antiretroviral. Phase one, two, and three studies of intramuscular cabotegravir with or without intramuscular rilpivirine, the NNRTI, have been completed and led to the drug's approval. Here were the first two studies out of the gate. These are the phase three studies of the novel combination of all injectable cabotegravir and rilpivirine. They were called the FLARE and ATLAS studies. FLARE enrolled over 600 treatment naive adults, started on a conventional oral regimen of a Bacavir 3TC dolutegravir, but then for people who were able to suppress switched to cabotegravir rilpivirine, all injectable every four weeks, or continued that standard three-drug oral regimen. And this was designed as a non-inferiority study with a margin of 6%. The good news at one year, all patients on the study, over 93%, had virologic suppression, and they concluded that the all-injectable regimen was non-inferior to the oral regimen. They've continued to follow these patients. The most recent update was three years of data and durable suppression of the all injectable regimen continued. The ATLAS study enrolled a population who were on standard regimens, over 600, with virologic suppression. And they either were randomized to continue what they were taking or changed to the all injectable regimen. Again, cabral pivoring given for orally for four weeks, but then converted to an all injectable regimen given on a monthly basis. This too was a non-inferiority regimen with a margin of 6%. And once again, you can see over 90% of all patients suppressed below detection. And once again, they concluded cabral piverine was non-inferior to the standard oral regimen. And uh, we saw follow-up data recently published out to two years of follow-up. So these two studies led the FDA to approve the all injectable regimen uh, now two years ago. And uh, this is the approval it's indicated as a complete regimen for the treatment of HIV in adults to replace the current regimen 
in those who are virologically suppressed on a stable regimen with no history of failure and no known or suspected resistance to either CAB or Rilpivirate. So kind of a complicated approval there. The uh, guidelines, we went ahead and gave some suggestions to treating physicians, and we recommend the monthly CAB Rilpivirine as an optimization strategy in those patients with current virologic suppression for at least three months who don't have baseline resistance to either CAB or Rilpivirine, no history of prior virologic failure, don't have active hepatitis B, again, because they would be on no effective agents for that, are not pregnant or planning to become pregnant, and don't have, aren't taking drugs with significant drug interactions. Well, this is a tough regimen, right? Monthly cabral pivorine. So to address that was a subsequent study called Atlas 2M. This took people who are on standard of care ART regimens or on monthly cab rolpivirine. You can see over a thousand people were enrolled and randomized to either every four week cab rolpivirine or the investigational arm every eight week cab rolpivirine. And you can see the doses are higher. This too was a non inferiority study with a margin of 4%. Once again, 93% of all patients did well, and they concluded that every eight-week cabrolpivirine was non-inferior to every four weeks, and recently published three-year data to show durable results. So this was a relief and led the FDA now a year ago to approve IM cabrolpivirine every other month, which is uh, much more popular with patients and providers. Well, the other sticky thing about cabral pivorine was the thought that you needed to give it orally first to make sure that there weren't any idiosyncratic reactions like rash or hepatitis prior to the injectable, because once you inject these drugs, they are there for weeks and weeks, so you can't get them out. So this concept of direct to inject became uh, considered. In a sub-study of the FLARE study at week 100, they took people who had taken their original antivirals, um, about 200 of them, and gave them the option to switch to cabral pivorine. And what they did was, this wasn't randomized, they allowed people to go direct to the injections, and about half of them did that, or do the four-week oral lead-in with oral cab and real pivorine, again, to try to reduce any risk of toxicity. And about the other half of the patients elected to do that. What did they find? Well, at, uh, at follow-up, you can see most patients above 90% continue to be suppressed below detection. And importantly, any side effects or adverse events, type, severity, frequency, were similar between the two groups. So these are the best data we have today to say that it is safe to go directly to injections with cabral pivorine. And the FDA reviewed this and updated the label and now said that the lead-in dosing was optional. Again, popular with patients and providers. So the current status of cabral pivorine is a loading dose, 600 milligrams of cab and 900 milligrams of real pivorine. And these are big injections, three milliliter injections at two different sites. The bi-monthly maintenance dose, so every other month, um, are the doses that you see listed, similar doses, and those again are three mil injections at two different sites. This can be tough for some patients for sure. Um, Rilpivirine does require cold chain storage, and this is an injection that must be done into the gluteus medius, which you'll remember from anatomy, is the upper part, upper outer part of the buttock, and has to be done with a Z-track method of injection. So it's not a simple injection. Consequently, you need a private place for, object, for injections, and this can be a problem in people who are obese, have buttock implants, or tattoos on their rear ends. 
What do we do about missed doses of cab cabotegravir rilpivirine? Um, the package insert says adherence is strongly recommended. And then there can be planned missed injections. So if, they're, if a person is late by more than seven days, what they can do is to start the oral formulation one month after the last injection and continue it until the day that injections are restarted. This is known as the bridging strategy and should prevent virologic failure. But what about unplanned missed injections, which can come up? Uh, the first thing the package insert says is reassess to see if the patient really is an appropriate person for this kind of dosing. If it's been less than two months since the missed injection, just resume monthly injections. If it's been more than two, then you give a loading dose and then resume injections. What are the risk factors for virologic failure on cabril pivarine? Well, they took patients from the ATLAS FLARE and ATLAS 2M study, and uh, only 13 had confirmed virologic failure out of over 1,000. So you can see a failure rate just above 1%. They went back and looked at risk factors, and the number one risk factor was rilpivirine resistance-associated mutations at baseline. Odds ratio of 40, so 40-fold increase if people have baseline resistance to rilpivirine. And remember, because it's an NNRTI, resistance to other non-nucleosides could confer cross-resistance. What were the other factors associated with virologic failure? Low rilpivirine concentrations, certain subtypes of HIV, or higher BMI slightly increased the risk of failure. Well, that's one of the new options. The other new option we have to turn to are the HIV entry inhibitors. Now, HIV entry inhibitors have been around for a while. Remember the three steps of HIV entry. So here's HIV here. It's got its glycoprotein 41 and then its outer membrane glycoprotein GP120, which finds the CD4 receptor on the surface of the CD4 positive T lymphocyte and binds to it. That's the very first step in the viral life cycle. That induces a conformational change in the CD4 molecule and allows binding uh, sorry, a uh, conformational change in GP120 that allows binding to the CCR5 or CXCR4 receptor, the chemokine receptor. When that binding has occurred, it then allows fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane and infection has occurred. So with three steps of HIV entry led to the development of three types of inhibitors. The first one we had, of course, was in Fuvertide, which is the fusion inhibitor, but requires twice a day injections, so has not been extremely popular in recent years. The second group are the CCR5 inhibitors, specifically Maraviroc, uh, but that requires an assay to determine the tropism of the virus, and so this drug too has not been very popular. More recently, fosfatemzivir fos is a small molecule that binds to GP120, and prevents it binding to the CD4 receptor. And alternatively, ibilizumab is a monoclonal antibody, so it has to be given as an infusion, which binds to the second domain of the CD4 receptor, preventing binding. These two come up more frequently, sometimes in designing regimens for heavily treatment experienced patients. So what do we do with that group, those with MDR or multi-drug resistant HIV? The strategy is to find a new active drug and then to optimize the background regimen. And both ibilizumab and fostemzivir were approved by the FDA specifically for treatment experience patients. So uh, a small pilot study, only 40 patients, looked at using ibilizumab in heavily treatment experienced patients and resulted in 43% able to re-suppress by week 25. And this led to the FDA approval of this drug in 2018. Again, we don't use this drug very much because it does require infusion every two weeks. Much easier to give is fostemzivir. This was the the, the drug studied in the BRIGHT study, which was over 270 
heavily treatment experienced patients. They gave fostemsivir and then optimized the background regimen, and that allowed 60% of the patients to resuppress their viral load through the end of two years. So that led to FDA approval for specifically for multi-drug resistant HIV just uh, in 2020. And they have presented follow-up data with this cohort of patients, published two-year data, and then recently presented five-year data, show durable results with the strategy of using the new drug fostemsivir and combining it with an optimized background regimen. So we do better for treatment experience patients today than we had in previous years. And then came the capsid inhibitors. So the most recent development in antivirals. Just a reminder of where the capsid comes into play. So here's HIV again, binding, entering the cell. And the green structure here is the HIV capsid, which encases the viral genomic material, the viral RNA and viral enzymes. This migrates to the nucleus of the cell, and then the capsid has to disassemble to release the viral RNA into the nucleus of the cell. Later, when viral proteins and RNA have been synthesized, they need to reform viral particles, and the capsid needs to be reassembled for full maturation and infectiousness of the new viral particles. So the capsid inhibitors are novel because they inhibit both the disassembly of the capsid as well as the assembly of the capsid. So really hitting the life cycle at two different points. And the lead compound, now an FDA approved drug, is lenacapavir. It's potent in the test tube on the picomolar level, active against all tested subtypes, and has a very short or long clearance or reduced clearance in the body and increased solubility, resulting in a very long half-life of this drug, 30 to 43 days that will permit very infrequent dosing. It is developed with both oral and subcutaneous formulations. These are the published phase one data, and you can see at the highest dose, this drug with the new mechanism of action, the capsid inhibitor, led to a two log reduction in virus um, by the end of nine days. Uh, so showing that it was a potent antiretroviral agent. It has been studied um, both orally and subcutaneously and a sustained delivery formulation actually led to six month dosing of subcutaneous lenacapavir. What we're looking at here are drug levels. And you can see at the two highest doses, they retain target levels of the drug through the end of six months. So subsequent studies dosed lenacapavir subcutaneously every six months. And that's the current uh, studies, the phase two and three studies. So the Capella study was a step forward for lenacapavir specifically looking at its activity in heavily treatment experienced patients. This enrolled people with MDR HIV who were resistant to at least two drugs and three of four classes had a detectable viral load and less two or fewer fully active agents. They enrolled a randomized cohort of 36 people, small study, and a non-randomized cohort of people who had no available options at all. For the randomized cohort, they were randomized two to one to continue their present regimen and then add oral lenacapavir um, or placebo for a short eight days. And then at day 15, they could optimize their antiviral regimen based on treatment history and resistance testing and added subcutaneous lenacapavir every six months. Well, how'd they do? Remember, heavily treatment experienced patients. Well, the primary endpoint of this study, according to the new FDA rules for drug studies in heavily treatment experienced patients, looks at the change in viral load over a short eight days. And here we're looking at a half log drop. You can see 88% of the LEN group versus only 17% of the placebo group. Highly statistically significant, showing activity in treatment experienced patients 
And that's what led to FDA approval. But of course, we want more than eight days of activity. They went on to show the change in viral load through 15 days. You can see lenacapavir in blue does better and is highly potent. And after you optimize the background, um, looking at week 26, you can see over 80% of these heavily treatment experienced patients now resuppressing to less than 50 copies, a significant result. So they concluded this new compound, lenacapavir, safe and well tolerated. They did see resistance. So four of their patients developed capsid resistance mutations. The overall conclusion was sustained virologic response, and this is what led to FDA approval of this compound. They also presented follow-up data through the end of week 52 at last year's CROI, and you can see again over 80% of the patients were suppressed to less than 50. And uh, as you would expect, the number of fully active agents in the background led to a greater proportion able to resuppress. So where are we with lenacapavir? Well, it was approved by the European Medicines Association uh, last summer, and the FDA approved it just a couple months ago in December 2022 for treatment experience patients, and it is now available. They went on to do a parallel study looking at lenacapavir in treatment naive patients. Now we have a lot of options for treatment naive patients, but here's one more that's been explored. So this was a randomized study for treatment naive with detectable viral loads and CD4s over 200. And it's small, about 182 patients were randomized two to two to one to these options, either lenacapavir sub-Q every six months with two nukes, and then they dropped a nuke at week 28, or same design, but they switched the nukes to bictegravir at week 28, or all oral two nukes and lenacapavir, or the control arm was TAF, FTC, and bictegravir, a common regimen that we use today. And what did they find with this study? Well, here's the good news. All four arms did well. So you can see 85 to 92% are suppressed to less than 50 copies through the end of 28 weeks. And remember, that's when they dropped or switched the nukes. And then that was durable out to the end of about a year. So the subcutaneous LEN regimens performing comparably well to the Bictegravir regimen through the end of a year. All of those things have led us to where we are today. We can expect that we can suppress viral load levels in the vast majority of our patients living with HIV. Here's data from my own Department of Health, New York City Department of Health. They published data from 2018 for 62,000 New Yorkers living with HIV on antivirals, 89% were suppressed below detection. And I'll emphasize this is not in clinical trials, this is in clinical care in New York City. Then they went on to publish individual hospital data, and here's the Cornell data. So we follow over 2,300 people, and our patients are 93% suppressed. But we're seeing these kind of results, obviously, all over both the developed and increasingly the developing world. People are doing well on these agents. That's translated to a life expectancy that is now similar to the general population, as you know. And here's some data from, to support that from Kaiser Permanente, the big insurance system, looked at 39,000 people in care living with HIV from the period 2000 to 2016. And they matched their life expectancy with 10 times as many people who did not have HIV. It was a diverse population, as you can see there. And here's what they found in terms of life expectancy. So the blue line are people living without HIV. And you can see a 21-year-old can expect to live 60 more years and that's gone up slightly, but more importantly, are people living with HIV? And again, that 21-year-old could expect to live into the 60s, 70s, and up into the 80s by the end of this time period. 
And in fact, if you looked at people who started ART before the CD4 had dropped to less than 500, there is no difference from the general population. Big success story. All right, lastly, where are we going next? Investigational antiretrovirals, what do we have? Well, the first thing to say is additional um, innovation may happen to cabotegravir. Remember, we're still giving it every other month. Could we do better? Here is a new formulation of this compound that's injectable, but extended release. And what you see here is the standard formulation of CAB shown in green. So you get great levels that taper off in mice and rats. And the red is this new formulation. So you can see you get durable and predictable target levels of drug through the end of the year. So could we have yearly dosing of cabotegravir? Well, we need human studies. What about a novel way to give cabotegravir besides an injection? Could you give a patch? And this is a micro needle patch. It looks kind of like it would hurt there, but it doesn't actually hurt when you put it on. And they are testing micro needle patches for antivirals. And here's just some data looking at different levels. And you can see target levels were achieved um, given every three to four weeks with these patches in human studies. So we look forward to additional innovations. And then there's a bunch of new antiviral drugs in the pipeline in our existing classes, nukes, non-nukes, protease, entry, integrase, and I have to move this line over now, capsid, and then new classes of drugs like maturation inhibitors and broadly neutralizing antibodies. And I'm just gonna feature a couple of these to end this talk today. So is latrivir, is it adenosine analog that inhibits reverse transcriptase by preventing translocation? So it is an NRTTI, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. The interest in this compound, once again, is a very long half-life. It has broad activity and it can be available in a parenteral formulation. Here was one of the early studies just showing that a single dose led to profound virologic suppression by the end of 10 days, and it went into clinical trials. It was given daily orally um, with uh, 3TC and duraverine versus a standard duraverine 2 nuke regimen and uh, had favorable comparable outcomes at week 48. We're looking at the percentage suppressed below 50 copies. And you can see either the Islatravir, they dropped the 3TC, Duraverine um, at one of three doses, or the standard regimen performed similarly, about 80 to 90% suppression. And they gave follow-up data out to two years. So that's a novel two-drug regimen that could go forward. And they went into phase three studies with Islatravir. Um, they also went into weekly oral dosing, monthly oral dosing for prevention, long acting injectables, and even yearly implants. So could we give antivirals in an implant much like we do for contraception? Um, we saw some switch studies, looked at people who were suppressed and switched them to this two drug regimen of Islatravir, Duraverine, or a comparator. And interestingly, We've not seen these results presented. These are all from a press release. They reported that people did well. Antiviral efficacy was comparable between the two drug versus the standard regimens. However, they noted for the first time lymphopenia occurring, and it was dose related. There were three doses of the Islatravir. and that was released by press release. And that obviously is concerning. CD4 cell counts were decreasing. That led to an FDA clinical hold and a big investigation as to why this was happening. What they've turned up is that it's dose related. So the higher the dose, the bigger the problem seems to be related to his latrivir triphosphate levels and is reversible. Most recently, the FDA has released the hold with low dose is latrivir. Another investigational compound, MK8507, I just discovered its name, Ulanivirine. Easy to say, right? It's an investigational non-nucleoside 
it too has an exceedingly long half-life, which supports once weekly oral dosing. So you can see where we're going here. Could we have a once weekly antiviral regimen? In a phase one study, it showed potent antiretroviral activity as shown for you here, um, about a log and a half by the end of several days. And that supported weekly combination studies. Drug resistance looks similar to Duraverine. Here's the most important mutations at 188 and uh, combination with 106, as we've see, seen previously. The phase two study, they combined this compound, ulanivirine, at three doses with oral islatrovir, but they saw the same toxicity, decreased lymphocytes and CD4 counts. Was it the islatrovir or did the new compound have a contribution? That's still being figured out, but development has been paused. What about the broadly neutralizing antibodies? We really need to think of these as antivirals as well. Remember their mechanism of action, they bind to GP120, which was what's shown in this schematic. And they can bind to the GP120 in different areas. So the V3 stem shown in green, several antibodies, V1, V2 loop, several antibodies, CD4 binding site, a bunch of antibodies, and perhaps the membrane protein external region. So if you bind to one of these, you prevent HIV from attaching to the CD4 cell. And just to summarize, there are more than 17 broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been in clinical trials looking at safety and pharmacokinetics. Generally, they were well tolerated and showed antiviral activity as HIV attachment inhibitors. There's also this interesting idea about a vaccinal effect that they have enhancing effects on host immune responses that would distinguish them among antiretrovirals. And uh, right now there are strategies to improve their potency, breath, serum half-life, and delivery. And what's being looked for are more potent, broader, and multi-specific antibodies with longer half-lives. Hopefully that could be dosed every two to even up to six months. And instead of infusion, subcutaneous dosing. And also, might we have combination strategies? So combining BNABs, two, three, or four together, that's in clinical studies, or combining them with long, other long-acting antivirals. And the AIDS Clinical Trials Group has a study that we are part of with one of the antibodies in combination with cabotegravir. And there's a Chinese study looking in a combination of a monoclonal antibody with the fusion inhibitor albuvertide. So we certainly will hear more from this class. Lastly, brand new mechanism of action, the HIV maturation inhibitors. And so here's HIV. It has its, the last step of its maturation. It's got a polyprotein that has to be cleaved. And this cleavage is necessary for maturation and infectiousness. And of course, the HIV protease is what cleaves it. Well, we've, been, uh, we've had protease inhibitors for years, but the other way you could prevent this cleavage is actually by binding to the polyprotein. And that's how these maturation inhibitors work. It results in immature non-infectious virus. Now you may have heard of maturation inhibitors. They have a long track record here. The first one that was explored was Bavirumat, but up to 50% of people had no response to bavirumet due to polymorphisms in GP120, and it was abandoned. Another one came along, made it to phase two, but had significant GI intolerance, and it too was abandoned. A third one had a nice combination uh, with cobacistat that led to a 1.7 log copy per mil viral load decrease, but it was felt that the need for boosting was going to make this drug not attractive, and it too was abandoned. That leads us to candidate number four, GSK254, and a phase one study showed it could be given once daily without boosters and did not have significant drug interactions with nucleosides, dolutegravir, or contraceptives. And so that led to moving forward with this compound into phase two, which was considered a proof of concept study. 
It enrolled treatment naive people living with HIV, just 34, and compared 254 with placebo in two parts of the study. And the endpoint was the change in viral load. And you can see at the highest dose tested, two log drop in viral load in part one of the study and uh, slightly less than that in part two. And these are published data. Resistance did occur in part one of the study over 11 days. And that's why they shortened part two to eight days to try to prevent the emergence of resistance. This is moving forward in phase 2B studies. So the maturation inhibitor in combination with either dolutegravir or in combination with 3TC and dolutegravir. And those studies are moving forward. Um, another study is looking at combinations with two nucleosides. So potential future regimens, what are we looking forward to? We have one pill once a day today. We have every other month injections. What else could we look forward to? What about once weekly antiviral therapy? So consider one pill once a week. That's being explored in these two studies. What about injectables? Can we do better than every two months? I've suggested we can, so maybe every six months or even every 12 months. Implants, a brand new way of giving drugs. These are being explored with TAF, and as I mentioned, with Islatravir. And they could be inserted and left in place for six to 12 months. And then I mentioned patches, which would be another way to do it. So in conclusion, what can we say about ART today? Right now, we have 35 drugs. Integrase inhibitor-based therapy is used worldwide. It's potent, well-tolerated, and we have one pill, once a day regimens given orally. We now also have our first long-acting injectable drugs, but they have to be given every one or two months. So for the future, we want potency and tolerability, more convenient dosing, and likely newer formulations to give people options. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for your attention. Hopefully I left some time for questions and uh, thanks for the trip to Miami in the middle of my day today. Hey, fantastic, thank you. Okay, everyone who wants to ask questions can raise their hands. I see Mario. That was, as usual, fantastic, <clears throat> very, very informative overview of, of where things stand. My question is kind of philosophical. <clears throat> you know, given the, you know, the myriad of, of inhibitors we have, the, you know, the, the improvements in administration, where does that put us in terms of the quest for a cure for HIV infection? I, I mean, do, is, is, the, is there the same, you know, dry, is, is there the same rationale for pursuing a cure when, you know, and, you know, I'm kind of agnostic, although I'm I'm more and more moving towards the, the anti-retroviral maintenance side. <clears throat> but I just, you know, I'd like your opinion on that. Uh, yeah, no, can I also add to that question, if any of your drugs act on the reservoir, if you can, like, especially the capsid inhibitor or something? Okay. Yeah, uh, the second part of the question is, as we well know, even highly effective, potent, well-tolerated regimens really don't budge the reservoir over the course of decades. I honestly don't think the newer drugs have been tested in that regard. I don't think there's any reason to think they would do any better in terms of decreasing the reservoir. So it really goes back to Mario's question, what's the rationale for pursuing cure at this point? And uh, I think what people will tell you is just that taking, having to take any drug is still a burden and uh, there's costs associated with it. There's toxicities and there's stigma. Um, so I think that's why the cure agenda still has a lot of enthusiasm. People would rather cure an infectious disease than be living with a controlled one. Although realizing how far we've come with controlling. So I'm supportive. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe I uh, I can just interject here. The the in, the injectables that you have to give once every two months or once every yeah. month would require patients to come for follow up to the clinic, right? To get the drugs. 
doesn't that increase the cost dramatically and the irritation factor of going to the hospital? It, it's a big problem because our best regimens right now, we can see the patients every six months with one pill once a day oral therapy. And the visits have become very routine. <laughs> Check in, do the viral load and a couple of labs and say, you're doing great, keep going. With the injectables, even the best one we have today, you've got to come every two months and get the injection in the buttock. So you can't give this in a pharmacy. You can't give it in another kind of place. It has to be a healthcare facility. And so, yeah, that, that's very inconvenient. The other thing, if you looked closely at the indication, it's only for people with suppressed viral loads right now. But who are we trying to get to with new injectable mm -hmm. antivirals or people who have adherence problems. And so we really need better data to say whether these will um, be a good option for that group. There are patients today who say, I don't want to take a pill um, and I don't want the stigma of having pills. And so some of them are, are electing to do the every other month visits, but it's a tall order, I agree. And certainly it increased costs and increased staff time as well. Okay, thank you. Asabita? You're muted. You're muted. What is the standard of care for pregnant females? And has any of these drugs tested uh, on the, your penetration through the fetal placental unit or on the flip, flip side uh, blood-brain barrier? So there's a lot of good safety information now for pregnancy. Um, and we have a series of regimens that are recommended for pregnant women. Probably the most common one used right now is tenofovir, and we now know either form, so the older TDF or the newer TAF have a strong record in pregnancy, FTC or 3TC, and then dolutegravir now has a long safety record in giving given to pregnant women. So that's emerging as uh, as a regimen that can be given. Um, there are alternatives to uh, non-nucleosides like fabarins have been given for years and then the protease inhibitors as well. What we're missing in pregnancy right now is data on the newer drugs. So we have nothing on bic uh, There's no data on cabotegravir and then certainly none on the new capsid inhibitor or the new entry inhibitors. Yeah. And the long-term consequences on the offspring, you know, neurocognitive, all kinds of uh, pathological states exist because of this ART. Well, that may be due to, I'm not an expert in that area, um, that may be due to the use of older drugs in the past. Um, kids do continue to be followed. Savita, you may know more about this than, than I do. Yeah. No, there, there's still, the data is not in, but the exposed uninfected babies are followed along. And in my personal opinion is that they do really well, but there are a lot of people studying them and studying them and studying them to find out what's wrong with them. Something about behavior and CNS has been implicated, but the last word is not in. Um, I did have another question for a trip. Um, is there anything different in terms of treating acute primary infection versus chronic? All the most of the data you presented today was on chronic uh, people with HIV. So, is there something there that you could give in primary infection that would really reduce the reservoir or something? Be very active and effective. So that group is, is certainly tougher to identify. You have to kind of be there when they've yeah. seroconverted or they're, they're in the middle of a seroconversion illness. Consequently, there has been far less experience with regimens there. Um, you, so people are suggesting that if you do treat earlier, you can impact the reservoir. Um, and so coming in with standard regimens, standard three drug regimens um, that you can decrease the size of the reservoir by treating early. What the ultimate um, outcomes and implications of that, I think are not certain as to whether there's really long-term benefit. 
But mm. maybe I can get a last question in before you take off for the Arctic wilderness. <laughs> um, you know, given, you know, we have some great regimens now, really suppressive. Is there any evidence that the, the some of the comorbidities, immune inflammation, is any less with some of these really um, recent formulations and, and, and inhibitor combinations? Yeah, I think it's an active area of study, Mario. Everyone's interested in that. Can you prevent the inflammatory reaction that HIV induces? Certainly, we know antivirals are pretty good at that. Um, and I don't know that it's been carefully studied with some of the newer ones. Um, the hope would be if you could shut things down faster, of course, that you could avoid that inflammation. But that's an active area of research right now. Yeah, especially in the aging population. If you are saying they're living the same lifespan, we want to know if they still have any adverse effects. So I guess it's being studied. I do see Chima's hand. So I, I'll let him ask the last question. Hi, everyone. Um, that was a great talk, very informative. Uh, my question is along the lines of uh, what is known about the new drugs uh, in terms of penetration in the CNS, if, uh, if they can reach better or if it's, uh, if it's like the old ones that they better cross the BBB? So, so as, as you well aware, there's a longstanding controversy about do you need to get good levels in the brain and which of the antivirals we have today really get into the brain. Um, and neurologists will argue back and forth about this. And they even developed a central nervous system penetration index to try to help us with this. But I think what we see clinically, if you reduce the viral load peripherally, in the vast majority of patients, you do reduce it in the brain as well. Um, it hasn't been well studied for some of the newer drugs I mentioned. So the entry inhibitors, um, I don't think monoclonal antibodies are expected to cross over so well. And then I don't think we know anything about the capsid inhibitor. But again, if they're efficient in reducing peripheral viral load, I think we're going to assume or hope that they are also decreasing CNS. Remember uh, years ago when some of these first came out, we were worried that we would reduce the viral load peripherally and that HIV would continue to replicate in the brain and that we would be causing widespread dementia and cognitive changes. That didn't happen. We didn't see it. Perfect, thank okay. you. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. I want to thank Candice for introducing uh, Dr. Gulick, and of course, it was a terrific talk. Thank you so much. And we have to get you here in person. Yeah, Thanks. delighted to come back. Great to see everybody. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.